I'll now um, introduce Magnus into the conversation and let him explain who he is and, and where he's come from and what he's been doing um, to support us in the UK as well as internationally. So Magnus, welcome. Thank you, Beverly. Um, so my name is Magnus Ingman. I'm uh, Managing Director of Health Navigator uh, Limited, our, our, our UK um, uh, affiliate. I have a, I have a background from uh, McKinsey and Company working within uh, supporting healthcare providers. And um, with me here today, I also have Chris Bounds. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm one of the health coaches currently working in York. Yes. And also our, our head of operations. Um, so we will, for the next 25, 30 minutes, we will uh, talk through um, an intervention called practical health coaching that we have developed. And we will uh, go through how the, the background to the intervention, how it works, talk about the results, and also illustrate with a few patient examples um, how, how, um, how the intervention can, can benefit patients with uh, long-term conditions. So um, the following slide is probably something that you have, you have seen before and, and you know. Um, healthcare utilization, especially non-elective admissions, is really concentrated to a small part of the, po uh, of the population. We have done this for a couple of CCGs in the UK, and it's 1% often constitutes somewhere around 33 to 37% of non-elective admissions. Um, this analysis, together with another analysis, was actually the background to, to practical health coaching. So uh, we did, did this analysis for um, the Stockholm County and the Karolinska University Hospital, um, and they asked us to look into this more, how we, can, how we could support these patients. And this was roughly five years ago. Uh, so the other analysis that we did was actually look at um, how um, how these patients change over time. Uh, so what we see here um, is if you take the 1% group um, one year and then look at the same patient one year ahead. And what you can see is that actually only a small share of the 1% group is actually still a part of, of the same group the year after. So the insight is that these patients are not the static group, it's more rather a flow of patients. And the implication um, of this uh, is then that uh, these patients need to have proactive support because once they're part of the 1% group, then it is uh, too late uh, to make any change. And on this slide, you, you see a, 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 an illustrative example of, of deterioration for these patients, starting with increasing, frequen uh, increasing frequency of A&E attendances, non-elected admissions. At some point, the patients are flagged as high risk. Secondary prevention in initiatives are initiated, and, and at some point, um, the, the patient is, is down to the same level as before except for the fact that it's been um, painful for the patient and uh, has led to healthcare costs. So the purpose of practical health coaching is really to circumvent this period of deterioration. Um, and how the, and then to how the intervention actually works. Um, the, there are four, four important parts uh, in the intervention. The, the first thing is, of course, the identification and the timing of the identification. So the purpose, of the, uh, the purpose is really to find the patient as early as possible in the disease progression. We have a prediction system in place, which is uh, on one part based on a quantitative model, a prediction model. And um, the second part is actually a qualitative screening made by our health coach. Um, the difference, I think, between our prediction model and other risk stratification systems is that we have optimized for avoid for in, increase in avoidable non-elective admissions uh, compared to current risk stratification systems that tend to focus on on a, a high number of non-elective missions in the future. 
the intervention in itself begins as soon as possible after identification. And why is that? Well, in York, for example, and COPD patients, 59% of the patients that are identified in our model will have a non-elective admission within 30 days from identification. So if the intervention begins too late, then they will already have started to progress, uh, started to deteriorate. The intervention is a non-clinical, um, primarily telephone-based intervention, and the purpose is really to empower patients to take care of their own health. The, the intervention actually starts with, a, with a one physical meeting, and at that meeting, um, an action plan is created for each patient, um, and then that action plan is then followed up and iterated throughout the course of the intervention. The intervention in itself is, is, often, um, is often performed for six to, six to eight months, but it's not time limited. So if the patient needs support for a longer period of time, the period will receive support. It's just that the whole purpose of the intervention is not to create dependency. So the purpose is really to, to make the health coach not being needed by, again, empowering the patient, motivate, motivating the patient to take care of their own health. And when the health coach perceives that the risk uh, for a non-elected mission for this patient is at its lowest point, then the patient is, uh, then the phased out uh, process begins, which usually takes one to two months. So now we thought that we would go into uh, two patient cases, and I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Chris. Okay, so, so we've been working in York now since uh, April, and, and I just want to present two patients. Obviously, some of the details have been changed uh, uh, for confidentiality. But firstly, um, Helena, who Helena has currently been in the program about 133 days. She's a female in her mid-60s. Uh, when I met with her, uh, she would lost her husband two years ago. She was his main carer. He had his own health needs. We can see that. In the last 12 months, she's had 15 A&E admissions and uh, 10 hospital admissions, so a fairly significant um, uh, utilization of healthcare in the last 12 months. Predominantly, she was being admitted with syncope episodes, so fainting episodes, um, with no specific cause or diagnosis. She'd been referred to a, uh, a, a specialist uh, unit in Leeds. It was quite obvious when I met, met Helena, um, but she came with lots of anxiety. Uh, she was fairly socially isolated. Um, she really didn't recognize what was going on, but I would say by the end of the session, um, she really had picked up that actually there was no physiological cause for, for what was going on. It was much more about bereavement and anxiety. What was significant about Helena was actually she disclosed that She'd been sexually abused as a child, um, and really that was 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 kind of uh, coming up since the loss of her husband. So when we meet with patients, um, we we generally spend an hour uh, to an hour and a half really discussing. We don't lead we, we don't lead the conversation. We guide the patient. There's some, some key bits of information that we need. Um, but we also really give it the opportunity, the, the patient, the opportunity to really open up and, 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 and talk. Um, what was, uh, as I said, that she had disclosed sexual abuse and, and she'd never really had that opportunity before to really talk about it. Um, so she'd never, never disclosed this to, throughout her life. Um, we, we, we start to look at gaps in their care, and we look at gaps that, that, firstly, that we can fill for the patient, that we can bridge that gap. Um, and, and, and the first month was really uh, us being quite, quite, quite uh, active in, in, in closing some of those gaps. Um, and then we work with the patient to become more active in, in, in closing them gaps themselves. 
for for Helena, it was quite easy. But but we contacted the GP. We 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 uh, arranged for a referral uh, to psychology. Unfortunately, there were some delays, so I was able to signpost Helena to a a charity that provided some some support for survivors of sexual abuse. The end results with or the early results with Helena, um, she's had two admissions. Um, a and E admissions, but no overnight stays, no inpatient stays, which is fairly significant when we look at her her previous 12 months. She recognises her symptoms. Um, she knows when potentially she's going to have a fainting episode, and she's learnt some coping uh, strategies to, to to remove herself from stressful situations. So the end result isn't that she she uh, passes out. Um, Subsequently, she's she's disclosed uh, much more um, and, and and more distressing events in her life. As coaches, we're not counsellors, but we can really support. I can really support Helena to to really open up about what's been going on in her past to 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 her psychology. Now, Helena sounds uh, oh, um, quite a fictional character, but actually, we have. Quite a few patients that are presenting to us with 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 similar issues, so she's certainly not alone. So, so just to to, to summarize the, the the impact, I mean, we would expect her to, if she had not received this intervention, we would probably expect her to have some five A and E attendances and at least three to four hospital admissions, and and instead uh, she she has uh, now only needed two A and E attendances. Absolutely. Um, so the next patient I want to present is is, is Peter. Uh, Peter is looked after by one of my colleagues up in York. He's been in the program for 62 days. Um, a male in his mid 70s, living with wife. He's got a previous medical history of cardiac issues through stroke and hypertension, also with uh, cancer of the bladder and cataract. Uh, and his his really 12 months care contact has predominantly been accident and emergency. Um, what what uh, we discovered during during the uh, initial meeting is actually a lot of uh, what was going on was anxiety. He was having some 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 issues, um, lots of urinary tract infections, etc. Um, and he was really worried that the cancer was coming back. Um, so it wasn't drinking fluids, increasing his risks of UTI, etc. He had low confidence um, and low motivation and, and, and really um, ha ha was really lacking confidence in, in, in his primary care for whatever reason. Um, we were very, we very easily uh, managed to, to get Peter appointment. Really, really support Peter to ask the right questions during this appointment, which often we see with our patients. Um, he'd had a scan, uh, but he was waiting for the results. He was going to be waiting quite a prolonged period of time. So, within the first week, we were able to contact the medical secretary, reduce his waiting time for the follow-up, and, and get his results pretty quickly. We also gave him some basic advice about fluids and, and ensuring that he increased his fluids to reduce the risk of, of, of urinary infection. Uh, what we can see, the early results are with, with Peter, he's had no A&E admission. Um, he's got a plan uh, with, uh, for pain control with his GP. He, he's seen his consultant. He's got no, confirmed no, uh, no relapse of his cancer. Um, and now he opens up much more to to, to the coaches and, and to his primary carers about his anxieties um, and, and is able to really manage some of his physical symptoms better. Um, Peter is, 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 is one of 165 patients that we're currently looking after in, in York. As, as, as a part of our, um, our project, we don't just measure um, care contacts and, and, and reducing uh, avoidable care. We also look at quality of life, which uh, we know is incredibly significant. So what, what, what this shows, um, on the left we've just got two pie charts, but really shows how, how satisfied the patients are with the care. And we can see that that's fairly significant, um, of 70% with yes or very satisfied. But in terms of quality of life, and what we can see here is, these patients are, are, are uh, 
almost at the end of their tether. Um, and, and what we can see is with our support, over 54% um, over can, can have really stated a, a significant um, improvement um, of their quality of life. Um, and, and, and on the right, we've got some quotes from patients. And I think the biggest, the biggest thing that, that I hear and my colleagues hear is really about giving the patient uh, the time to talk. That initial meeting is incredibly powerful but also having a consistent person that they speak to. Um, we speak to patients, depending on, on, on what's going on, we, we may speak to patients daily, twice daily, uh, sometimes weekly, um, but it's very individual and it's based on, on what that patient really, really needs. What's also incredibly uh, valuable is, is uh, um, engaging with the stakeholders. So, so uh, over the last four months, we've been talking to, to all the stakeholders in, in, in a patient's care, and, and, and they've really welcomed what we're doing. Um, and we, can, we don't, we don't um, increase burden on GPs, which is in, in incredibly important. And one of this quote is just from a GP that I spoke to recently concerning a, a specific patient. Just really pleased that somebody is keeping an eye out. And quite often, these GPs know. Uh, the patients that are, uh, are, are consumers, um, but also have, having credible concerns about these patients. But there's, in the past, been nobody to manage them. Um, we, we recently had a meeting with patient representatives uh, through Healthwatch, and a significant comment was from from one of the patients is is being able to offer this to a much wider audience because they really felt that they could have done. Uh, with this kind of service recently for, for their mother. Um, community specialist nurses, and, and, and I think this is quite a powerful message, is one of the respiratory nurse specialists in York said, actually, you're making my life easier because we're really focused on that patient um, or patient group uh, and, and giving her the opportunity to really focus on a, a much more medical model. So um, we've talked uh, now into a little bit about the intervention, how it works, a few patient examples, and, and also what, what patients are saying about the service. And now I want to talk more about uh, the, the outcomes from, from interventions like this. So the interventions like practical health coaching that increase patient activation um, typically, you know, have, have uh, the sort of, have the following effect. So it has effect on non-elective admissions, and, and we've also been able to show in Sweden that we actually have an effect on elective admissions as well that might be due to error in coding, but significant effect on elective admissions as well, especially uh, also reductions in A&E attendances and, and outpatient visits. We, um, we also sh shorten length of stay for admissions that are not uh, avoided. And typically, uh, the, in, the admissions that we avoid have a longer length of stay than other um, than you know other admissions with the same DRG code, and that's really because these patients are more have have deteriorated more than than other patients within the same DRG. And we talked about the quality of life. Um, it also studies on interventions that increase quality of life also show better health outcomes, but that's not something that we have, uh, we have tracked. However, we have tracked mortality as a safety outcome, and we have not been able to see any differences in, in, in mortality. So it's not, so the intervention per se does not uh, lengthen life. It really just makes sure that patients are not, uh, you know, sick, um, you know, in the meantime. And wanted to show also a little bit about the results uh, on, on total bed days, bed day reduction. So uh, we have done this now, performed this study as a randomized control trial with an intervention group and a control group. 12,000 patients have received the intervention in Sweden, and more than 30,000 patients in total have been included in the study. We have been able to show a reduction in total bed days of around 25 to 45 percent. Uh, it has varied, um, and uh, it, it has varied between sites, and it has varied between years. So 
initially when we started um, when we when we did the pilot in 2010, we had a reduction of 50%. But then when we scale it up, we actually lost all of the effects because we, um, we scale it up without ensuring that everyone did this in the same way. Um, and then in 2013 and 14, we, re we uh, regained the results. So it is a very, it is a very sensitive intervention. And it's important that, um, that we follow the protocol exactly uh, the way that it, it, it uh, should it should be done. The um, results have been published a couple of times, and lastly in European Journal of Emergency Medicine, now in 2015. We have, as Chris said, we have uh, we started practice health coaching here in the UK roughly a year ago. We began including patients in August. In, in Vale of York, um, we actually have the first we have the first results now, which uh, are in line with uh, the results that we have achieved in Sweden, which is very promising. We are now scaling up to add um, a couple of additional CCGs during spring 2016. The um, we are performing the intervention in the same way that we've done in Sweden as a randomized controlled trial. And Nuffield Trust is the one evaluating the randomized control trial. And Martin Bards is the director of research. He is, he is uh, the chief investigator. And the study has also been adopted on the NIHR, SCR, and National Portfolio. Um, and uh, we're really glad to have, um, have the support of NHS England in this. So we, we also had a, a site visit here in uh, New York by Martin McShane a, a couple of months back, which was really, really exciting. So right now we're really happy about, um, as I said, about the results here in York, and we we look forward to uh, um, to scaling this up and, and really supporting um, patients within the uh, NHS. For any other comments or questions or anything like that, uh, you have uh, my contact information here in the material. So please feel free to either call or email me anything. But um, what, what I was say was, um, you know, I've heard that presentation a couple of times now, and each time I pick up something new and something more from it. Um, so I, I do think it's worth, you know, the audience who are here today just really having um, a, a couple of looks at it, and certainly the, um, the information will stand out. Um, after the presentation, will be really good to look at. And Chris, thank you for taking us through. Um, you know, that's what makes it real, is hearing people say, this made a difference to my life. And I think, you know, that, that's kind of what we're all here for today on, on this call. So thank you and welcome. Um, Katie, I'm going to turn to you first, my increasingly learned right arm about um, health coaching and all things that matter to patients. So Katie, can I introduce you into the conversation? You might need to explain who, who you are a little for people who perhaps don't know you and then present your question. My background is I'm a patient and I have a number of long-term conditions and um, I think in my question that I've just sort of posted on here, my, I posted the caveat that it took me two years to get to the point that it sounds like they can get patients to in six months um, and I just wondered how transferable this program is across the board with all long-term conditions. And do, they, do you see that, Magnus, as, as in the future of what you're doing to do to take it to different long-term conditions? Thank you for that question. So, um, initially, when we started to do this in Sweden, we actually had different interventions for different patient groups. So we had, for example, one intervention for people with diabetes, another for heart failure, another for a COPD, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we um, what we saw is that really for these types of chronic conditions, um, the risk of deterioration is really based on the same underlying you know, variables. So, for example, social isolation, motivation, having the proper diagnosis, the proper care plan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, right now we actually. Um, include all types of patients in the intervention, and we actually also have patients that don't have a chronic condition. They, they are not that many; they might be 10%, but, but um, we still we still include them um, in the intervention because they 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 have the same benefits as other patients. Um, 
what we exclude um, are are often um, you know uh, mental uh, health problem mental health problem brand uh, so i i would say that uh, the inclusion now is 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 uh, is very very broad and in sweden we we also actually now um, apply the same intervention to uh, pediatric a and e so children with asthma uh, we do it for um childhood obesity uh, we also have a back to work program focused on people with pain so yes it, it has a, it can be applied to very a broad sets of you know, chronic conditions brilliant and i think that that's the importance of it is partly because there, there is rarely somebody with one long term condition um you know they they've got other things going on so it's the the, the applicability and the transferability that's really important a very good question um katie thank you um and should we come to you now just to present your question which i think is starting to look at the data in a little bit more detail i'll just read his question out and then he can uh, comment on the on the response back um to what you say so based on the um statistics uh, uh based, based on the stats percentage what does this equate to in terms of numbers of patients so where you've used the percentage what's the actual number of patients well, if we take York, for example, which has a population of roughly 300,000, um, we yep. we we believe that roughly 3,000 patients uh, would would benef benefit uh, from the intervention. These patients can often be found then in the they're often like in the top five percent of patients utilizing most healthcare, but not but um, they're often not found in the top one. Okay, and I think Andy's communicating via the chat box because um, he's he's connected but he can't speak. Um, so we'll we'll pick that up as to whether that uh, responds to. So we may come back to that one. Um, so Annabelle, let's see if we can bring you into the conversation. Uh, I think I think yeah, um, Annabelle's um, uh, question was fairly straightforward. So how do the patients get into the program? Yep. So um, the since this is. Look, the patients are identified. Um, we are we identify them through uh, running our prediction model through uh, hospital records. Patients that uh, are identified are sent an invitation letter from the hospital, and then the patients then send back a permission slip if they're interested to participate in the study. Um, and at that point, we then screen their medical records to make sure that they're suitable. And then we, we we call them and schedule a meeting, um, where we do an additional screening. And then, uh, if they're interested and, and and we think it's a good fit, then they sign a consent form and then the intervention begins. And the reason why we have this process is again because this is a randomized controlled trial. Um, we um, uh, we uh, we need to follow all of the you know, ethics guidelines when this is. When the evidence is, is solid, uh, we would be able to, of course, have a, a different inclusion process. Brilliant. Thank you. And just remind us of that timeline of when that might happen. So when, when do you become a little bit freer in, in your approach? Well, it really depends on, uh, really depends on the patient's numbers, but anything from uh, two, to, mm -hmm. two to three years. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it is fairly straightforward to set up. I mean, now when we – it was – fairly complicated to do it the first time, but now we have a proper blueprint for how to set it up in a new CCG. So in now when we're going to set this up in, in Stafford and Wolverhampton, uh, it takes us around three months and it's fairly, and, and, it, and it's not very labor intensive to set up. Brilliant. And then Andy's come back with a, a further question on his, which is around um, how is patient identifiable data protected and how it, how are uh, acute path systems accessed? Well, um, it is protected uh, right now with the fact that we uh, do not, uh, our prediction system runs through hospital records, but the prediction uh, system is not in our hands. So it is controlled by the hospital. So we don't get to we don't get any patient information until the patient returns the permission slip to the hospital, 
whereby they inform us that the following patient has now per, uh, given you permission to screen their medical records and to contact them. And that's when we, so, so that's the first time when we know, get any patient information at all. And then there's a the question of and how is PASS. acute uh, PASS systems? Yeah. Can you please just explain what PASS systems are? I haven't seen that acronym before. Uh, so that, that's our patient access system that, where the data is kept for the patient. So it's in a hospital, usually. Um, okay. somebody, so, Andy will probably so explain it better. We don't access then, the hospital records as that it's uh, really, we have given the hospital our prediction model and they run it. Um, and then we have our health coaches who are trained nurses have access to the medical record system. So once a patient gives us permission, um, we can uh, access uh, the medical record system to, to screen those patients. Okay, so somebody with more technical knowledge than me may want to come back on that one, but we'll, we'll park that one for now, and that okay. makes good sense. <laughs> Annabelle's got um, a, a question that probably always niggles in the back of, of my mind quite a bit as well. Um, and the second bit is, is the bit that niggles for me. So, so the question is, firstly, how are the coaches trained and who are they? And then secondly, um, do you see the role for healthcare support workers in this role? So it's just trying to work out what's the current work, well, I might be adding Annabelle onto your thoughts, but, you know, we've got a, a fabulous workforce. How do we, um, you know, upskill them or sideskill them into some of these, um, the, the roles that will have a big intervention? So it's just a conversation about that. It's Chris here. So in terms of uh, coach yeah. training, uh, we have quite a structured training process which um, has been adopted from the learnings in, in, in Sweden. Um, so, so we are all trained nurses and, and we have various different backgrounds. I, I'm a diabetes specialist nurse, my colleagues, uh, I've got a, a modern matron and an A&E nurse. So it's the, the background and experience really aren't the, the, the pertinent points in terms of the right kind of coach. It's much more about our abilities in terms of communication, active listening, using open questions, etc. The training, like, as I said, it's, it's quite a structured training um, over a, a period of time. Um, a lot of, you know, on the job learning uh, with support from from coaches in in Sweden. Yeah. And um, in regards to the second the second question. Um, in Sweden, we, where we have done this now for five years, we, we have uh, health coaches that, are, that do not have a, a like, clinical background. So we have, for example, like so, uh, social workers. Uh, there is, as, as Chris said, this is really about um, being, able to, being able to coach and to, be, and to enjoy problem solving because it's really about finding what is the potential root cause for a future non-elective, for avoidable non-elective admission. What, what we need to do now to, to, support, to, uh, to support the patient. So it's not necessarily, it's not necessary to, to have a clinical background. The reason why we have it now is because, you know, when we, now when we start to uh, implement this intervention now in the UK, um, we, we feel it is, um, it is, it's good to have trained nurses as health coaches because they know the healthcare system. But I think once we start to scale it up, we will, we will be able to utilize other types of resources as health coaches. And are they always, because the, the, the words I've heard, social worker, A&E nurse, et cetera, et cetera, all sound a level of um, skilled qualification <laughs> rather than uh, people who've got a practice experience so it sounds like you know people who've been through some level of academic training rather than somebody who may have a more practical um, path into into the NHS is that is that a, you know is there a criteria in your you know they must have a master's or must have a qualification in in something well we uh, no it's really I mean I think as Chris said the most important thing is really to I mean I think the quality the the, the this it is the skills that, that we look for mm. rather than any accreditation or qualification. Um, mm. And the skill is really, I mean, active listening is, is, is an important part, being able to have 
to form a motivating dialogue. That's important. Um, being able to and enjoy problem solving. Um, those are the those are the key bits. Bits to it. And and then Andy's asked a question that builds on that, which is around accreditation for the training. And and have you got anything set up at this moment? Well, only only internally. Um, and uh, something that we are actually will implement the new accreditation process now during spring, starting in Sweden, which will be then a, a six month training program, uh, and there will be um, you know accreditation tests after four months and after six months. But uh, a purely internal accreditation system. Uh, but Annabelle's come back with saying um, that she's working on a pilot looking at managing long term conditions across social care um, and uh, primary care in northwest London. And um, would love to include this into our pilot. So I think I, you might have to speak directly to each other rather than through me. Uh, Absolutely. For that one. So I'll, I'll connect you after, after the conference if that's okay with you both. Perfect, Evelyn. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so I, I think we've gone through all of the questions. Um, I think there's been some quite active discussions. I've been trying to follow on Twitter, but um, I've been also trying to concentrate on what you've been saying. So it's been a, a, an interesting approach to try and do. So we'll get um, uh, Lynette Lehman, who, who in my team is an expert around social media, to do a summary. And we'll circulate that with the, uh, with the slides as well so you can see what the activity uh, what the activity was. Um, so I'm just going to ask, give, give you a couple of seconds, um, Chris and Magnus, just to think through, um, you know, what's the one point each or two points that each of you might well leave with the audience to do the minute they put the phone down, what, what is it that they need to do? Um, and also to say that I will connect you with Andy as well as he sees synergies between what they're doing and what you're doing. So there's uh, this potential um, relationship building there, so I'll, I'll connect you there. But while you just have a think of your um, last few points, I'll uh, just turn around back to the audience and say thank you very much indeed for uh, staying with the, with the discussion. I think this is just the start of conversations around health coaching. It's clearly something that's gaining traction um, in the system and is starting to move from, you know, something that's nice to do if you have the time and the energy to actually being a core part of um, of making change happen both behaviorally and across the system. Um, so this is a very exciting um, exciting time in its um, evolution. We'd like to you know perhaps predict in a couple of years' time that it will be core and it will be an inherent part of um, every service specification. So delighted to be here at this point. Um, and I'll hand back to Magnus and to Chris just to give us a couple of points to motivate us on a Friday afternoon as to what we're going to take from here today now. So over to you. Thank you, Beverly. I think one thing that is really motivating, I think both me and Kristen in, in our work is that for most interventions, it's really about, you know, if you want to make people healthier and increase quality of life, then it's usually something that will cost money. And what's really exciting about this intervention is that whilst we you know, prevent people from deteriorating in their health and whilst we increase quality of life, we have actually managed to you know, perform the intervention at a cost that is uh, um, offsetted completely by the savings for commissioners. And on top of that, it's a, it's a support for hospitals because they even though they lose some revenue, they, they, they get a, a reduced number of bed days that is, uh, that is uh, you know, more, that is a, a higher benefit uh, than, 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 than the reduction in, in, in admission. So it's really a win-win. And on top of that, you know, GPs um, and carers are positive to the support that they're, that they're getting. So we're really, really, really excited about working with practical health coaching in the UK. So we look forward to uh, many more interactions like this. Brilliant. And Chris? Um, I, I, I guess from, from my perspective uh, as, as, as working for a nurse before becoming a health coach, but I, I spent 10 years really thinking I was coaching patients. Um, but I think mm. 
reflecting on that now as, as really having that time to coach patients. I, I didn't have the time, and I think most practitioners would 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 uh, reiterate that. But it does take time. Um, it really does take a lot of focus to to to, and the focus has to be the patient at all time, a, a, a much more holistic approach. I I agree. I agree, and I think you know it is about that that skill and, and, and recognizing it. So brilliant, thank you very much everybody. I'm going to draw this WebEx to a close at this point. Um, we will be circulating uh, information and we will keep you all connected because this sounds like a conversation that's going to uh, keep evolving and I uh, wish you a very good afternoon and have a lovely weekend and thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. <laughs>